So welcome everyone to this webinar on disaster risk reduction and disability. As we are all affected by the COVID-19 or coronavirus crisis, this may be a useful webinar. And I hope you will all enjoy it, learn and share your own learning and questions as well. I'm Els and I'm an education and child rights specialist with more than 30 years experience of living and working in Africa and Asia, also seven years in Bangladesh. If you want to keep in touch with me after the webinar or you have questions or comments later, feel free to contact me. My contact details are mentioned on the last slide. This webinar has been organized at the end of the webinar, there will be time for questions and answers. And if you want, you can already write your questions in the chat box during the presentation. While you are listening, maybe it is good to mute your mics till later after the uh, webinar. So one of the most important messages of this webinar is that disasters have a different impact on different people. Adults react differently to disasters compared to children or youth, and those with and without disabilities are also differently affected to disasters. DRR often only focuses on adults, People with disabilities, older people, pregnant women and children and youth are often forgotten in DRR and left behind when disaster happens. They are excluded from disaster preparedness measures, are invisible when it comes to community and risk mapping or evacuation planning. They find it harder to access shelters and safe spaces due to environmental and attitudinal barriers or protection risks, and they often receive inadequate or inappropriate relief and support. So I really want us to learn about people with disabilities, especially children and youth, and how they are affected by disaster and what we can do about this. of this webinar together with Enroute. This is a Dutch NGO working in Bangladesh and the most important partner for Nikitan in Bangladesh is Disabled Rehabilitation and Research Association, DRA. Um, this is a disability organization that has a lot of experience in working on disability issues. The projects of Nikitan focus on children and youth with intellectual and complex disabilities and their families. They use a holistic life cycle approach, meaning that we don't focus on just one age group or one kind of children, but we look at the whole life cycle, starting with a young child and also looking at when these children are youth and young adults and are looking for skills and employment. It's based on an approach with active participation and empowerment of the beneficiaries, the children, the youth and their families. It focuses on strong cross-sectoral collaboration, collaboration between different ministries, different sectors like health, education, social welfare, finance. And it is based on working closely together with local governments to increase local government ownership and local government taking over some of the responsibilities that Nikitan has started. So who have not worked with children Technologies going around that it's not easy to go into detail within this webinar. So maybe we need a special webinar on that. But it's not purely biological or social. It's about how people with disabilities interact with their 
environment with other people, how they are accepted, how they get a chance to show what they can do instead of only focusing on what they do not, uh, what they are not able to do. You often also hear words like impairment. Impairment is terminology that the World Health Organization uses, and it's really the limitation of what a body can do. For instance, you can have a visual impairment if you're not able to see very well, or you can have a focus impairment if you cannot pay attention very well. Disability is certainly not inability. There are lots of different characteristics that people have, and disability is just one of them. People also have a lot of strengths and a lot of abilities. So we should not just focus on what they cannot do. You also hear terminology like differently abled or differently challenged. These are all kind of vague to me. I mean, every person is differently challenged. Every person, whether you have a disability or not, is differently able. So that is normal. Disabilities are also not the same. They can be mild, they can be moderate, they can be severe. So it's even said by WHO that People with disabilities, 80% of them have mild or moderate disabilities. And they can, with some small adaptations, be included in mainstream schools, in mainstream employment. So we need to make those distinctions and not put children or youth of adults with disabilities on one big heap and not look at the differences between them. And every person, even if they have the same disability experience that disability in a different way. So again, other factors like personality, like um, home environment, like chances that people get or do not get influence how a person experiences their disability. Disabilities also may be visible or invisible. If you look at the picture on the left hand side, it's difficult to see whether this young person has a disability, yes or no. It's not visible. I know that he has an intellectual disability, but you cannot see it. While if you look at the picture on the right, you can see that this little smiling girl cannot stand on her own. So she has, amongst others, a physical disability that prevents her from standing on her own. She is using a standing frame, a support system to help her stand upright. So again, it's very easy to judge people with disabilities by what we see, but we should not forget that a lot of people have disabilities that we cannot see. So, how does this link to disasters in Bangladesh? We know that Bangladesh is ranked as one of the world's most disaster-prone countries. We all know about the frequent flooding, the cyclones, the cold waves, the erosion, and it affects a lot of different people. On top of that, we have environmental hazards in Bangladesh like air pollution, the climate crisis, and those can also turn into disasters if they continue. We have, for instance, also the crisis, which we could call a disaster with refugees, like the Rohingya refugees from, um, from Burma, from Myanmar, that have come to Bangladesh and are uh, located in the south in uh, big refugee camps. And then, of course, currently, we have the coronavirus pandemic, a crisis that is um, happening in the whole world. And in some countries, they can respond to it more easily than in other countries. Bangladesh being a low-income country with people living from day to day, people not having a regular income, this crisis may have a very serious impact on how people survive. 
these are just some pictures to show you what kind of disasters a country like Bangladesh may be affected by. If you look at the picture top on the left, we're looking into environmental disasters. Bangladesh in South Asia is a country that has the most environmental disaster impacts compared to other countries in South Asia. The most people are affected by environmental disasters like air pollution, like water pollution and other disasters. So it's important to also think about those disasters, how these can have an impact on children and children's health. The Rohingya refugee crisis, Bangladesh has very hospitable um, invited lots of these refugees to Bangladesh and they have to survive in very difficult circumstances. So this is another crisis that has to do with um, different, different people, different issues. Um, these can be environmental, these can be political, and they're happening, and Bangladesh, as good as possible, responds to this. Cyclones are not, com are not uh, strange to Bangladesh either. So after cyclones, a lot of people um, have to build up their lives again and build up their houses again. And then, of course, flooding is also something that happens quite often in Bangladesh. And you can see the person in this picture has a physical disability and has to move around during flooding with, um, with his crutches. So all these kinds of issues and disasters have a special impact on people with disabilities and we need to start thinking about them and also planning for them so that they are part of disaster response, they are part of uh, rehabilitation after disasters strike. So what are the effects on children and youth with and without disabilities? Disasters can be especially traumatic for children because they don't, not, they don't understand the situation. Why did a disaster strike? What has happened to their lives? They have no control over the events that have been happening. They also have less experience in dealing with stressful situations. And they may not be able to communicate how they feel. They may be afraid, they may be sad. And so we need to look at how children react to disasters and how we can help them. Also, if they can't express themselves very well. They are difficult for everyone, disasters. But if you have a disability, they, the, the difficulties may multiply. Displacement is one of the results of uh, some of the disasters that happen. And then places of shelter may not be accessible for children with disabilities because they can't enter, they don't know exactly how to enter because they are using wheelchairs or they are using crutches. So these are important issues that we need to think about. The education system may be disrupted because of disasters and people may not have access to health services. So what are the results of that when you have a disability? So environment hazards, for instance, can become silent disasters, air pollution, water pollution. So a lot of deaths and illnesses can be um, can be contributed, attributed to environmental hazards. And we need to think about those as well. Loss of family income. Um, if there is a disaster like now with the... Um, um, if there is a disaster like we are now with the uh, crisis, we will see that people living in poverty may keep their children out of school and uh, allow them to, to engage in child labor. And these children may not come back to school also. It may result in food shortages 
and certain family members may get less food than other family members. Very often, children with disabilities will get less food than other children. And there is often during these kind of um, emergencies like we now have, there is a lot of stress at home. There is no income, there is no food, and this may result in domestic violence. And this domestic violence, we will not be able to respond to in uh, a situation like we now have, because people are not able to move around and provide support. So we need to look at the effects of these kind of emergencies on children and youth, both with and without disabilities, but especially with disabilities, because they are often not taken into account when we look at these issues. So we have this corona crisis now. It means that many people cannot go out, they cannot go to work, they have no income. And it has a special impact on children and children with disabilities and their families. Because a lot of information about the corona crisis is not shared in accessible formats. Some people need information through braille, through sign language, in big print, or as pictures, or in very simple language. If we don't provide that kind of information, then people may not get the information they need to stay safe. Some of the support services that people are dependent on, especially children with disabilities, may have stopped because people are not allowed to move around. They have to stay home. A lot of disrupted routines for especially children with attention deficit disorders or with um, um, uh, other kind of disabilities, they have a problem if they have no regular routines. Children need these routines to be able to cope. So if that is disrupted because of, for instance, in this case, the corona crisis, then these children become uh, upset and it's more difficult for parents to support them. It's also often not easy to distance um, when you have a child with disabilities that you have to care for, parents will come close to the children. So if a child has been infected by uh, corona, then um, the parents may be infected as well. But the parents need to take care of a child with disabilities and this cannot always be prevented. Schools are closed, day centers are closed. And this may put children with disabilities at risk of neglect and abuse. So there are no uh, care workers going to the families anymore. They don't know what is happening inside the house. And we don't know what's happening with children with disabilities. Are they being cared for as they are normally cared for? Or are there issues with the family? resulting in less care for children with disabilities? And is there even abuse taking place? We don't know. So we need to find out how we can get this kind of information during a crisis like this. So this is an example that has come from uh, Nikitan. And it's, I will read it. It just illustrates how issues can emerge, how situations can change because of the corona crisis. Marufa has a mild cerebral palsy. She studies in grade 10. Her parents divorced and her mother remarried. Marufa's stepfather doesn't accept her. Every day he humiliates her and calls her bad names. She is also not allowed to sleep in the house, on the outside, on the veranda. Because she went to school before the corona crisis, Marufa could avoid her stepfather's humiliations and name-calling. But now, due to the closure of all schools, Marufa is just like everyone else at home. Her stepfather lost his job and now takes out his anger on Marufa. Her mother, because of her husband's violent behavior, is afraid to take her daughter's side. With every meal, food is given last to Marufa. But now, 
with so little to eat in the family, she doesn't get any food. Nikitan's staff received an urgent call from Marufa asking for help. So situations in families may be difficult already before this crisis, but because of people losing their jobs, people losing their income, not having enough food, situations may change and children with disabilities may be the ones that suffer most because of that. So Nikitan as an organization tries to respond as good as possible. So they support the homeschooling for children. They help parents to support their children to keep working on schooling. So they give assignments, they call the families three times a week, they try to follow up whether things are going well, and they also ask parents to make pictures of the work children have done. So education is continuing in a certain way. Um, you see that a lot of parents are actually very enthusiastic to be closely working with their children on schooling uh, issues. And it works pretty well. On the right hand side, you can see that people from our partner um, are providing cash support to families that have children with disabilities especially if the parents have no work or they are daily laborers, they are dependent on da daily money, daily wage, then during this crisis they have no income anymore. So it's good to support families with additional money so that they can buy food. So the Corona response advice for teachers during the lockdown there are different um, people in this response and advice for teachers is there, advice for parents is there, but of course it's important to keep things workable. Um, we cannot expect teachers and parents from a distance to do the same things as they did before. So it's important for teachers to keep in touch with their learners as much as possible check on their well-being, check on what they can do in terms of school work. So this can be done through phone calls, through SMS. They can also look at what kind of technology is available. So they can send information through SMS, explanations, a quiz, a game. So teachers are actually doing that in the Nikitan program. It's important not to overwhelm parents with lots of requirements. They are not teachers. And it's important that they feel supported by the teachers who provide distance support. And it's important to acknowledge the parents for doing a good job. Um, and it's beautiful to see how parents take up this ta task to help children with their school education, make pictures of what they are doing, make pictures of the results of the work that their children have done. It's important in that sense to understand that education is something else than schooling. It's, it's much broader. So it's about learning skills and knowledge in school, out of school. So a lot of things at home can be done that help children to learn. It's also important to advise and support the parents during the corona uh, lockdown. So it's important to observe children's emotional state. Not all children express themselves verbally. And um, if you see as a parent that their behavior changes or they don't eat well anymore or they don't sleep well, this can indicate anxi anxiety or stress. So it's important also for the parents that they um, can cope with their own stress and their own, um, their own worries. It's important for parents to reassure children that they are safe. Um, and it's important that we role model that safety as parents, as adults, because children look at their parents 
for cues. How do they react to this situation? Can they cope? Then children can cope. So adults like parents and other community people must be able to model effective coping strategies themselves. It's important for parents, for families, to maintain as much as possible the normal routines. And if there are new routines, then also make them into new routines. Like, for instance, more frequently washing hands, uh, trying to um, not sneeze um, just in the open, not in your hands, but in your elbow. So there are all kinds of different measures that people should take to pre be prepared for corona and not spread corona more than it's already happening. And it's important for parents to encourage open communication. That's not always easy because parents in, in Bangladesh and in a lot of developing countries may not be used to open communication with their children, but it's important to find out how children are feeling, how children are coping, uh, create a mutual understanding of the situation, both for children and for parents. So it's important to look at children and youth with disabilities in this situation of the corona crisis. And in fact, in any crisis, also, what we have seen earlier, if there are environmental crises or for children from Myanmar having had to flee to Bangladesh. So it's important to look at children because they react differently from adults. So as UNICEF states, in times of insecurity, children and youth with disabilities are often the first to be abandoned by families and the last to receive emergency re relief and assistance. So we should include them in all the responses that are happening. These children also face a far higher risk of becoming victims of abuse and neglect compared to other children and youth. So when we look at issues of neglect, issues of abuse, we should not forget about children and youth with disabilities. We should always look into their situation as well. And this hasn't happened in the past. So we have to become aware of this and, and reach out to families that have children with disabilities to make sure that no abuse or neglect is actually happening. In disaster situations, children and youth are among the most vulnerable and specific measures are needed to reduce that risk and ensure that they have access to disaster response. So we should not wait to respond to the needs of children, youth and of course also adults with disabilities. And I would like to reiterate that it's very important that all these children and youth have different disabilities. So they may have intellectual disabilities or visual impairment or hearing impairment. So we have to make sure that all these children are seen and made visible and are actively engaged in disaster risk reduction. So then what is disaster risk reduction? DRR, or Disaster Risk Reduction, aims at preventing existing disasters and risks for future disasters. And ultimately, we want to achieve sustainable development. So we want to be better prepared for disasters so that development is not being um, negatively impacted. It is a bottom-up approach as much as possible. So starting at family and community level and making families and communities resilient. And it's very important that people living in the community, all those different people living in a community, are participating in disaster risk reduction so that we don't forget about children with different disabilities. Communities are not homogenous. They are not the same. They all have different needs. So if we have a 
DRR, a Disaster Risk Reduction Committee in a village. All these different groups within communities should be involved. Men, women, rich and poor, adults, youth, children, those with different disabilities, elderly people. So it should be a real kind of representation of the community in a disaster risk reduction committee. They should all be represented in the DRR committee and they all should be able to lobby for the rights and needs of those different people they represent. So children can talk about what children need during a disaster, like the current one. Older people should be able to lobby for the rights and needs of that group of people. Women should be able to lobby for the rights of women, etc. So when you ask DRR, disaster risk reduction um, people, then they often talk about different phases in a disaster response. So the first stage is the preparedness. So are communities prepared for disasters, natural disasters and other disasters? Are they aware of the needs of different people in their communities, medical needs, what kind of therapies some people may need, what kind of medication some people need. So this preparedness needs to be also focused on children, youth and adults with disabilities. Then the second phase is the immediate response when there is uh, a disaster. And this can be a natural disaster, this can be any other disaster like we now have with the crisis. So we need to look at immediate responses and recovery. So are there people in the community that need, that have lost, that need assistive devices? Are there people in the community that need mobility aids? So again, we need to be inclusive in this immediate response and also think of children and youth with disabilities. Then the third phase is mitigation and rehabilitation. So after a emergency, we need to look at the infrastructure. How has it been affected? How can we improve the infrastructure after, the, after this disaster? What kind of relief needs are there? And in the relief needs, we should not forget children. We should not forget children and youth with and without disabilities. And is the rehabilitation accessible for everyone? Are we not um, are we not forgetting about some families that may be living further away or are living with a child with disabilities? So again, it needs to be as inclusive as possible. And then the last stage of disaster risk reduction is then the development stage, where we try to build back better. And one of the issues that we should really focus on when we try to build better after a disaster is how do we deal with community attitudes towards children, youth and adults with disabilities? Are they being accepted? Are they being respected? Do they get chances just like any other people in the community? So that is the development phase, which also needs to be as inclusive as possible. So it's important in DRR to make people who are vulnerable to disasters to create a situation where that vulnerability becomes less. So for instance, when people are doing information sessions in communities about disasters and how to prepare for disasters, it is important to make sure that people with disabilities are part of this kind of information session. Children are also given um, information about disasters at their own level. So this needs to be done much more inclusive than may have been done up till now. We need to address the disability stereotyping. Many people think that those with a disability, they cannot do anything. And that 
applies to everyone with a disability, which is, of course, not true. There are enormous differences between people with disabilities and what they can and what chance they get to show what they can. So it's important to empower children, youth and adults with disability, recognize their talents, recognize what they are able to do and give them a voice. And it's important to build resilient communities, communities where people think about each other, where all people, whatever their differences, are included in community development and community DRR responses. So that is what is important in development and in um, decreasing the vulnerability to the impact of disasters. So we are very interested in this webinar to see how children and youth can play a role in disaster risk reduction. And that should be inclusive of children and youth with disabilities. And Bangladesh has a lot of experience in this area. There are many organizations that may already do so. And it's important to make more other organizations, government and other players aware of this. Like on the left hand picture, you can see that uh, youngsters, young people are using songs and stories and pictures to educate villagers, including those with disabilities, about preparing for a cyclone. On the right hand picture, you can see how children and youth are demonstrating good practices for hand washing in the community so that other people can see now during the corona crisis, we need to make sure that we keep washing hands and sneeze in our elbows and um, use more hygienic behavior than we may have done in the past to prevent that other people get sick. But of course, disability inclusive disaster risk reduction is not that easy. There are many challenges. Very often, children, youth and adults with disabilities are considered as helpless victims by people without disabilities. They are very often considered as people who cannot do anything, which is of course not true. If you think But even people with severe disabilities are still given a chance. Another challenge for disability inclusive DRR is the lack of reliable disability data. Data that is disaggregated by disability type, by disability severity, by the age of the person, by where they live. So it's important that our data collection improves so that we know where do people with disabilities live, what situations do they live in, and how can we respond during a disaster. Communities also often lack the capacity to address the issues of disability. And because they don't know how to deal with people with disabilities, they exclude people with disabilities. But of course, we need to make changes there and DRR, disaster preparedness measures, must become inclusive, must become visible in the community mapping and in the evacuation planning for natural disasters, but also for other kinds of disasters. We should plan inclusively, thinking of all the people who live in our communities, also those with disabilities. It's also important, and this is in general quite an issue, that ministries do not coordinate very well in many countries. But if you want to meet the needs of children and youth with disabilities in disaster risk reduction, um, then that requires coordinated cross-sectoral cooperation. So a Ministry of Health, a Ministry of Education, a Ministry of Social Welfare needs to work together to be able to uh, provide responses 
to disaster. So, but there are also some examples of very disability child inclusive DRR also in Bangladesh. For instance, the government of Bangladesh, together with Save the Children, has created child-friendly spaces that are disability inclusive in the immediate aftermath of disasters to ensure children's psychosocial well-being. There is also a lot of capacity building of people with disabilities at community level so that they become the agents of change for inclusion and disaster risk reduction. An organization, CBM, has worked with DRRA and CDD in building capacity of people with disabilities for responses to disasters. Also, what is happening in Bangladesh and other countries is updating the community maps of households disaggregated by the age of people living, gender, and whether they have disabilities. So if a disaster strikes, they can respond and also can respond adequately to persons with disabilities living in those households. Also, the development of early warning signs and systems, information and communication materials have become more inclusive, more accessible and understandable for all people. So they also develop now materials for people who cannot see or cannot hear or have cognitive impairments who can who need more simplified materials so a lot of these initiatives are happening in bangladesh and in other countries so we need to build on those examples to extend and expand to all the different areas in the country so for you to have some examples of good practice in bangladesh save the children uh, created a collection of success stories from the humanitarian sector in Bangladesh about children and resilience. So how children can play a role in disaster risk reduction and helping other children to become aware, to be prepared, uh, making information available to everyone in the community. It's a very interesting uh, document for people to uh, look for. Um, and if you need the link for this, uh, please just drop me a line and I'll give you the link if you can't find it by googling. The next uh, saving lives and leaving no one behind from CBM is also a very interesting document from Bangladesh where they showcase, demonstrate how disaster risk reduction can be inclusive of children, youth and adults with disabilities. So, in fact, you have already a very interesting uh, number of documents with experiences from different organizations that you can use in making your own community or your own organization more disaster responsive. And um, on top of that, I would like you to have a look at a very short video from Bangladesh uh, on disaster risk reduction um, linked to a person with a disability. Um, I don't know whether it works if... My name is Kajol Rekha and I'm 23 years old. In 2003, I had an accident. I fell over a chair and one of my vertebrae slipped and severed my spinal cord. Now I am paralyzed. Before the accident, my life was good. I was living with my parents and going to school. And then they both suddenly on, died. My brothers looked after me and arranged my marriage. A number of questions. So feel However, free to after post my accident, my husband left box. me and remarried. It was difficult and painful. I suffered a Do lot. Do we have the video? Previously, I was treated with affection by everyone in my family. But that all changed. I was neglected and I became a burden to everyone. 
Life became much better for me once I was given my wheelchair. I used to be totally dependent on others, but now I can get out and move around. I received income generation training from a local development agency in growing vegetables and rearing chickens and ducks, then purchased a hand sewing machine and now draw an income by tailoring garments for people in my village. My house was modified to meet my basic needs, such as sanitation, making safe drinking water, and my lavatory accessible. It was also raised to reduce the impact of the floods. When it comes to floods and other disasters, people with disabilities are particularly vulnerable. There is generally widespread panic and in many cases, a person with a disability is forgotten and left behind. So now I am part of a disaster preparedness committee and we've made a list of all people with a disability in our area and we can take immediate steps to locate and evacuate them. I am also responsible for educating people about hygiene and general health for when the waters hit, such as how to protect their food against insects and contamination. Previously, I was afraid of the prospect of flooding, but now that we are prepared, I know what to do and I can face it. Now I am no longer a burden to my family and I am proud that I am a valuable and contributing member of my community. How Kazul um, is being included in a community is being provided with some adaptations in her home and some income generating training so that she can take care of herself and can live a valuable life and is valuable to the rest of the community. And this is, this is possible in many, many um, circumstances. We should not think that disability means inability. Disability is just a form of being different. But a lot of people with disability can do a lot of good things for the community, with the community and in the community. And it doesn't matter that you have a physical or uh, hearing or vision impairment. Um, so it's important to look at these diversity issues as something positive and create a community, create a school, create a health center that includes these people with respect. So with that, we have come to the end of my presentation. And on the last slide, I have put the website of Nikitan and my email address. So please feel free to get in touch if you still have things you would like to discuss or you would like to ask a question, then you will certainly get an answer from me. So let's see what kind of questions have come and see whether I can already now um, answer some of those. Yes. Oh, great. Yeah, I see a first question. My son is suffering from autism spectrum disorder. He has a few friends who are not special like him, but due to this ongoing lockdown, he is having a limited access to meet his friends. He never has been very fond of technology products. Hence, he doesn't do online. So how do I combat, wait, 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 how do I, oh, um, <laughs> the social isolation situation. That's a very good, in, a very good uh, question. I have a son with 
autism myself, so I recognize the question very well. Um, it's not so easy. In, in um, my country, in the Netherlands, they allow children during the corona crisis to play with a limited number of other children. Because what is said, and that's of course something we hear from the medical profession, children do not infect others seriously, or if they are infected, they are not infected in a serious manner. So it would be possible to have one of his friends to come and play with him, provided, of course, the parents of his friend uh, do allow that. Um, if that's not possible, then I guess you have to continue to try to do activities with your child at home. And that's, of course, after a while, a bit boring, um, but that's the situation. Um, and you say he doesn't like to use technology, but maybe you can try where they... He is interested in a visual Skype with one of his friends so that at least they can exchange ideas. Um, but it's a difficult situation, especially for children with different disabilities. So I, I recognize the challenge, but I think technology is still a way to try to create social contacts and help children to at least talk with some other people and see other people on, on a screen. Um, and if that's not possible, then you may need to look for other activities um, like reading, like, like video games, to distract him uh, or her sometimes. Uh, but I guess also schoolwork may continue and is also important. And maybe the activities that the school is giving is also something that, that you can do more together with your child. But I, I have to admit, it is challenging in a situation like this. Um, do you have any instructional video for how to communicate smoothly with children with childhood disintegrative disorder? That's a very important question and an interesting one. And I must say, at this moment, I cannot say yes to this, but I can certainly look for such an instructional video and get back to you on this through Anik or through somebody else. So if, if you send me an email with your email contact, then I can do that. Um, how do I pursue a career with this knowledge? I mean, do the development organizations of Bangladesh like BRAC, Save the Children, consist of any career opportunities for this particular sector? Again, a very, oops, a very interesting question. Um, I'm sure, I, I know a number of organizations like the RRA, like uh, BPF, like CDD, like CRP. There are lots of organizations in Bangladesh who have loads and loads of experience and knowledge for people who want to pursue a career um, in, say, disability inclusive DRR or disability in general, or DRR in general. Um, if you want to get in touch with me for linkages, for addresses, please let me know. And yes, you can suggest our online course of um, Sudokshu, if I pronounce that correct. Um, that's another one. Of course, there are very many online courses on uh, disability inclusive communities, disability inclusive education, disability inclusive DRR. So maybe together with um, some of our partners and, and together with um, um, with you as participants, we could make a list of links of uh, trainings of video clips as as a result of this um, webinar we could create an interesting list of resources that we could share with all the participants so that they have more ways of, of looking at the issues and finding new knowledge and new skills to respond. Um, I think I have to go up a little bit because I have missed a few questions. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a similar question about career 
um, possibilities in, in organizations like BRAC, Save the Children, um, in this particular sector. Um, there are, of course, then for that you need to keep in touch with these organizations and find out when they are looking for new staff. Um, but there are also many online, very interesting courses that can as a start, already help you to um, generate more knowledge, more skills, to develop yourself more in this area. So, um, again, if you want to get in touch with me personally, please go ahead and um, I, I can help you to more information. Um, my son is suffering from autism spectrum disorder and has a few friends who are not special. Oh, we did that one already. Isn't it? Yes, we did that. Um, is Rett syndrome an ASD? ASD being um, autism spectrum disorder. No, that's not the same thing. And maybe this is not the place to, to um, explain the difference. But if you want to get in touch, send you some materials that explain the difference. Um, how do I see those other questions? Okay, I have seen that one. Um, do you have any instructional video for how to communicate smoothly with children with childhood disintegrative disorder? For that, I need to do a bit of searching. Um, I'm sure they exist, but I need to, to link up with some of my colleagues in uh, disability organizations to find that. So again, whoever has sent this request, please get in touch with me and I will do my utmost best to get you some uh, material on that. Um, we are done with the questions. Great. I mean, if there is anyone in the audience that still has some questions, please feel free to get in touch with me and I will do my best to answer your questions and, and give you the information you are looking for. And, and maybe it's also interesting if you think this kind of webinar is useful, maybe we could think of other webinars more specific and we could work with our partner en route to uh, develop more webinars um, and, and get inputs from you as participants of what is important for you to learn more about and get people to, to be part of that. Um, wait, I have to wait, there is more coming. Let's just give that another chance. But I'm very happy to see so many participants. It's great that there is so much interest. Um, and you have some wonderful organizations in Bangladesh and, and some wonderful people working with children and youth with disabilities. So we need to also make DRR more uh, inclusive of children and youth with disabilities. Anik is typing very well. But please feel free to also share your questions or comments with me on, on email. That's absolutely fine. Let's see what's coming. That's a long question, Anik. So in the meantime, for people who want to keep in touch, oh yes, I've worked two years with Handicap International, and that's now Humanity and Inclusion, as meal manager. I know disability inclusion and develop, develop different tools for disability improvement, looking for an opportunity in the disability field. Yes, I think that's very interesting, and, and I'm very happy to see this kind of enthusiasm to to want to work with disability inclusion. I think it's important to keep in touch with all those 
a beautiful organization that that um, Bangladesh has already focusing on disability. But at the same time, I think it's very important to also look at mainstream organizations like UNICEF, like Save the Children, like Plan International, because those mainstream organizations also need to become more disability inclusive. So when they work with children, they also need to include children with disabilities. When they work with youth, they also need to think about how to plan for youth uh, participation of youth with disabilities. So I think it's important to, to, to look at both. How can we bring organizations together, the ones that are specialized in disabilities and the ones that are not? Because disability is something that happens everywhere. So every mainstream organization should be open to that. Um, I think it's also important that we improve our EMIS systems, education management information systems, so that children with disabilities are visible in data collection. Also for healthcare systems, uh, for social welfare, we need to look for children with disabilities and make them visible in data collection. <laughs> So with that, I mean, get in touch if you want to hear more about this, um, but feel free to get in touch with me and, and we can talk about this a little bit more. Anik, did you want to say something? No, if, if we are done with the questions, then we can close the program. Right now. Yeah, it, any, any people who have a question they want to quickly still ask, I hear birds at the background. Maybe if there are no further questions, uh, please feel free to get in touch and we can uh, still follow up. Um, please let us know what you thought about the webinar, whether it was useful, whether other webinars are wished for. Uh, keep in touch with me or keep in touch with um, En Route. Thank you very much for participating in this webinar. And I wish you all good luck and good health. And um, I hope the whole Corona crisis is, is ending very quickly also in Bangladesh and people can go back to school, go back to work and things are getting normal again soon. Take care and stay well.